Good afternoon and welcome to Virtual Face to Face with Dr. Bruce Gerald. I'm Alex Lukowski, Executive Director of Media Relations. Today on Face to Face, the state of the COVID-19 pandemic and more specifically, its impact on our university. Well, today marks 211 days since the WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic. And since that time, the disease has spread rapidly, although not evenly around the world. More than 35 million people have been infected and more than a million lives have been lost. At times, working away in one's home office, if you're able to, with all the Zoom and WebEx meetings, the pace of developments might seem slow, but in relative terms, of course, things are moving incredibly fast. So much has changed in the last few months. Our understanding of how the disease works has grown tremendously. We know much more about how it's transmitted, what works best to prevent transmission. Our list of diagnostic symptoms has grown. We have a greater understanding of the long-term effects after recovery. We've determined some of the treatments that don't seem to help, think hydroxychloroquine, and we're looking at a number of therapies that do appear to help, either to bolster the immune system so it can fight the virus, or to combat the immune system's often powerful and damaging overreaction to the virus. You may have read, for instance, that during the president's recent stay at Walter Reed, he received the trifecta of therapeutics, the antiviral remdesivir, the steroid dexamethasone, and Regeneron's experimental monoclonal antibody cocktail. Most amazing, of course, the progress toward developing a vaccine, or several vaccines actually, has shattered all expectations. Now, apart from medicine, our lives, our jobs, our university too, have all changed. Schools and universities have closed and opened and closed in different combinations. Research came to a near halt at UMB and has restarted in phases. Teaching and learning seems to have gone through each of the four stages of grief and uh, the first four stages of grief and are getting ready uh, to uh, get, get to acceptance by all appearance pretty soon. Individuals, teams, even whole departments are doing what was unthinkable and uh, in the past working from home and even more productively sometimes, although uh, I think everyone misses the human touch. Even the things we do to enlighten ourselves like this program or have fun like Saturday's Founders Gala, and Nancy Gordon wants me to tell you that it's not too late to register for that, by the way, it's Saturday. Uh, those things are nothing like we would have imagined uh, the last time the ball dropped in Times Square. And then, of course, what's changed in all the things that we do to stay safe? Well, at first, there were the usual respiratory virus countermeasures, hand washing, avoiding touching our faces, and so forth. Now, in addition to wearing masks at all times on campus, we have an elaborate system safe on campus to monitor and track symptoms and trace contacts where needed. It's a lot to try to digest the one program, but fortunately we have the right people to do it. Joining Dr. Gerald today are Dr. Wilbur Chen, associate professor in the School of Medicine, an infectious disease expert, and a member of Governor Hogan's coronavirus response team. Dr. Chen has spent a lot of time these last seven months doing TV interviews and appearing in the pages of everything from the Washington Post to Rolling Stone. Also with us are Dr. Marianne Clorin. She's an associate professor. She specializes in occupational and environmental medicine in the School of Medicine. She's helped guide the formation of the UMB COVID hotline as a member of the university's recovery task force. And Dr. Steve Deck, he's also a member of the RTF and is director of environmental health and safety at UMB. Thank you all for being here today. Well, let me remind everyone that this program is being recorded and will be posted on the UMB recovery website. That's umaryland.com slash coronavirus. If you'd like to participate, please use the chat button at the bottom of your screen and select chat with host. Send me your question or comment when the time comes for questions. Just listen for your name. I'll unmute your mic for you. All you have to do is speak up. With all that out of the way, here's your host, UMB President, Dr. Bruce Jarrell. COVID uh, and its management, and I know there will be many questions that you will have. There are still many questions that I have, and I really want to start out with my first question to get, get to the uh, points really quickly, uh, and it's for Dr. Chen to start off with. Uh, Dr. Chen, we keep hearing about a resurgence of COVID-19, and we keep hearing about the prediction, and yet are we seeing that yet? Is that really going to happen? How long do we need to be patient? Dr. Chen? Yeah, well, the bottom line is I think we do need to be patient. We're seeing that um, I think as of this morning, uh, there's only two states across the U.S. that have continued declining uh, case counts. Now, case counts are not perfect. So, um, you know, we think that there's underreporting. We are seeing uh, you know, cases that are slowly increasing. 
not to the extent that we're um, going to probably see when even colder toward the winter. But uh, right now, I think it's it's an uneasy lull at this time. We can describe it. And uh, I think we need to be prepared that there will be a resurgence. And, and what will be the clue in Maryland that you'll be watching most closely or clues? Well, I think that hospital a good marker, even though we're not able to capture all cases, even though we're doing much, much better with testing because testing is now widely available compared to early on in the pandemic, testing was not available. So again, hospitalizations and, and numbers of deaths are really those hard numbers that we can rely on to understand the burden of disease in Maryland. And yet, when you say that, uh, what I hear from the medical community is we've got much better at taking care of these patients and getting them through. So the death rate, the death uh, rate may not be the best indicator anymore, you think? Well, I certainly hope so. I, I certainly hope that we can minimize the amount of deaths, but still having prolonged hospitalizations, people on mechanical ventilator, even if it's for a shorter period of time now, compared to earlier on in the pandemic, is still a significant uh, drain on our medical system here in our uh, University of Maryland medical systems, but also throughout the state of Maryland and, and nationally as well. So, um, you know, again, those are indicators that I look for. I think you're right. We're getting better as we go along with treatment. And uh, that means that people are faring better overall. So maybe ICU days or something like that will be a, a, a reliable indicator for the future. Perhaps. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Cloran, thank you for joining us. Uh, you have been the primary architect or among the architects of our safe on campus system that many of us use. You want to describe that briefly and talk about how you see information and, and sort of what's your assessment about how well it's working? Sure, thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, the Safe on Campus program kind of grew out of a program that we developed um, for trying to track employee um, exposures related to COVID-19. We actually started building parts of it back in um, back in February, actually, um, in March, and then we took parts of it to turn it into you know what you see today with the Safe on Campus program. I think it's working. You know, very well with what it's supposed to do um, in gathering information from people, increasing accountability, um, getting us information that we can act on. Also, like very importantly, pushing out information to people based on what they report. So if somebody reports a problem, you know, immediately the system sends an email with information about how to get in touch with the hotline and what to do next. And, and, and keeps the supervisor informed. So I think that aspect of it is working well. We're still working on the dashboard for things like compliance reports and trend reports. Um, related to the question that you asked Dr. Chen though, I think another really important indicator and one that we um, should be able to, to keep an eye on with the SAFE system is the percent of reported tests that are positive. So I think that the, um, not so much the number of tests, but or number of cases, but the percent of positive tests among the tests that people report. And so if the positivity rate is going up, I think that's another indicator of the problem. So what's your level of comfort that you know that number for UMB and, and, and how would you describe that to all of us? Well, we're still missing out. Rate. Yeah, yeah. So we don't know it for everybody. Um, I can tell you that the positivity rate of those who have reported it, and we've had many, many thousands of people report their test results. So I think we've had good cooperation, but it's not 100%. And we haven't really asked for 100%. You know, people who are at home not coming to campus, we haven't um, asked them to be reporting, you know, on their results. But of those who have reported test results, the positivity rate right now is less than 1%. So, um, you know, those numbers, uh, I think, are trustworthy. That's a pretty low number, isn't it? Should, it is. we, should we be loosening things up or should we uh, follow what Dr. Chen is saying and say, it's coming, we just got to be patient? I think it's an indicator that we're doing things right and it's not the right time to loosen anything up, honestly. Um, you know, we, we have exposures pretty regularly that are reported through the hotline and um, we have had very few high risk kind of exposures to among 
people on campus or in experiential learning because people are paying attention to the distancing and the masking. So I think that that those measures that we are, are using to take care of ourselves and each other are making a big difference. And, you know, we're not seeing workplace exposures, you know, that, that we could be seeing. Yeah, because one of the terms I've been hearing a lot from Dr. Marcosi, and, and I think Dr. Chen, too, is this term of COVID fatigue or fatigue or relaxation of your precautions. And I think we all worry about that. Here we are. What you say, Alex, 211 days into this or whatever the number was? 211, yep. Yeah, it's hard to keep your intensity up for that period of time. So I guess we need to redouble our efforts in that respect. But we're doing pretty well from what I'm hearing from you. I think so. Okay. Uh, and Dr. Deck, thank you for being here too. Dr. Deck uh, leads environmental health and safety. And one of the things that you have put into place is a whole series of protective measures, particularly in air research uh, laboratory areas. Could you tell people a little bit about how that's working? And uh, you make uh, daily or weekly rounds and, and tell us what you're seeing in terms of compliance and comfort with the set of rules you put into place. Yeah, um, our office has been here throughout the duration when we went even to the restricted uh, uh, access to campus. So we we have a pretty good picture of what's going on out there. Um, the research community and all the people that support it have done an excellent job. When I walk around, it's, you know, I'm not going to say we don't get a report here or there about somebody not wearing a face mask, but overall people are doing a really good job about keeping their physical distancing and wearing the mask. So I think that the university has done an excellent job and we, we have a case or two. And when we get those, we, we track them down really quickly and, and counsel the person and, and make sure they correct it. But no, we're, we're doing good. Um, that fatigue that you just mentioned is real. I'm, I even get, you know, I want to go get a soda out of the refrigerator. It's like, I got to put my mask on again. So it's, you know, it's a real phenomenon. It is, it's tough. So I really do appreciate everybody keeping it up and really, really doing a good job. The early steps we did with keeping the social density low to where people are just here when they need to be here is really helpful. Um, is with Dr. Clore and the Safe on Campus that we, we make sure people don't come here if they have symptoms or if they're sick. That That's really critical too. And then when people are here, they are wearing their masks, physical distancing and washing our hands. So it's very basic and simple, but it works. And, and hopefully people keep doing it. So, so we're in a phase two, I believe that the number is for research and, and at least that referred to a density of about 50%. From, from your point of view, that is what you're seeing with your own eyes, how active would you say all of our in-person research lab activity is? Seeing a lot of activity or what? I mean, it's certainly not like it was before. Um, you can, I've stood on floors and have had conversations with people for you know, 10, 15 minutes and nobody passes you in the hallway. So it's not, it, it's very, I think people are coming in, doing their work and leaving. So it's definitely not overcrowded. I'm sure there's, there's a couple areas like an HSF3 where they got some high volume testing where they're a little more, a uh, little more density. But overall, it seems like people are able to spread out and, and keep their distance and wear their mask and, and come in and do what they need to do and, and uh, keep the research enterprise moving forward. Right, so we've moved forward uh, in research. Uh, we've now moved forward in clinical research and have significant clinical research taking place. Uh, we've, we've loosened up some of the student activities. One, one question I would have for the three of you has to do with athletics, and, and it's a two-pronged question. Uh, one, one of them is sort of your opinion about intercollegiate athletics broadly, since we don't have those. And, and two, how conservative or aggressive should we be at getting our athletic facilities uh, slowly back into motion? What, what's your opinion about that? Either one of you, or all three of you. What, I, what I'll say, I, one, I'm, I'm somewhat glad we don't have athletics here. <laughs> not, not too bad having to not have to deal with that. but. Uh, the folks at UREC, I've been up there, they've set it up, they've done a good job, they have a good plan in place whenever we do decide to move back in that area. I, I, I certainly understand we want to be cautious there, um, but I, I just wanted to relay that I, I've seen that they've done a lot of work and they're really preparing for when we feel comfortable to move forward. And I'll defer that kind of discussion on when we think we should move forward to the physicians on the panel. 
Yeah, I guess I'll jump on that question. And, um, you know, College Park does have a pretty large uh, athletics program, and uh, they've been trying to continue some training. Um, and uh, there have been some small outbreaks that have been documented in those settings. And they have been trying to be responsible. They've been trying to wipe down materials and equipment. They've been trying to frequently test. Um, they've been trying to stagger kind of uh, the training regimen so that they're not on top of each other, that they're not overlapping. Um, you know, so they, they tried to be responsible and yet they had outbreaks. And that's what we've seen across the US uh, with a, lar a large number of athletic programs in collegiate setting, but also professional setting as well. And that's with the vast resources of those professional athletic programs. Um, the problem it has been, it looks like to me, uh, that uh, you can control the situation for the program and for the athletics, uh, you know, uh, the players. But when they're on their downtime and they get together either off campus uh, for athletic collegiate athletics or, um, you know, again, they're blowing off steam and they're trying to uh, go to a bar or a restaurant. I think that that's where we're seeing a lot of this introduction. I think our campus is fortunate that we have very responsible behavior. We've not documented, um, you know, person to person transmission of cases while on campus. I think they're mostly imported cases. Marianne, correct me if I'm wrong, but again, the cases that we're seeing are from the community and they bring them in and we detect them. So um, again, uh, the part of the problem with having an open campus like ours is that we're always susceptible to someone bringing it in. And that's why it goes back to that voluntariness to uh, really report daily to the SAFE program and also for people to stay home when they're ill. Dr. Florin, anything to add to that? Okay, I, I agree with Wilbur. And yes, most of our um, cases that we've had have been community um, exposure, some, well, some exposures that have not resulted in transmission, you know, in the workplace. But for the most part, it's people bringing it in. Um, about UREC fit, I, I have concern about indoor activities where people are breathing hard, right? <laughs> so, um, I mean, I think if everybody can be working out with masks and very, you know, very far away from each other, you know, that would help, you know, with low density, but it makes me uncomfortable. Um, I do think that you know, the, what we're doing with, with a lot of people working at home and, you know, chances are, even after the pandemic kind of calms down, we'll have some hybrid work. Maybe maybe people, there'll be more, you know, kind of telework. I, I think we're at the point where we shouldn't be thinking this will be over in a week or so and we could go back to business as usual. Um, you know, I think that, that, that planning for a prolonged period where you have to have some alternate ways of offering services, you know, makes sense. And I know UREC-FIT has put into place you know, remote classes for people and things like that. So I, I if they shouldn't be thinking, and they may not be thinking of this as a short-term thing. But I think that that thinking of that as a as a an indefinite um, uh, offering, it would probably be a good idea. Thank you. Uh, I want to remind the audience to get your questions in so Alex can get you in line. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, one other comment from Dr. Deck and Dr. Clorin, and that is, you both work on the recovery task force which is something we've put into place to manage uh, our slow return to whatever normal becomes. Uh, can you tell people just a little bit about how that's working and the types of, of recommendations, et cetera, that you're making and, and implementing the recovery task force? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a first stab at it. I'm, I'm with the University Health Recovery for, uh, Task Force. and. The good news is for our for our task force, a lot of the stuff we already had in motion with with uh, developing the safe on campus, the promoting the different uh, behaviors that prevent COVID transmission. So we were already working on that before the the task force was formed. But it you know brought together a lot of expertise and knowledge that really helped us look at things holistically and and keep things moving forward and get them all implemented to start, especially the fall semester. And, and the other thing we haven't talked about is that the hotline Dr. Cloran put together has been absolutely critical to everything we do. Um, and that, that was in place even before I think we started the, the, the task force. So it's been very helpful, really, really helpful. Dr. Cloran, anything to add to that? 
You're muted. Sorry. I know. Yeah. Yes, looking for my mute button. Um, I think that having the recovery task force just provides a, a mechanism to to look at what we have to think about next. So, you know, one of the, we've been thinking about asymptomatic testing. You know, now that we have enough tests that we can even it's kind of a luxury to think about testing people without symptoms compared to a few months ago, right? And so one of the next things we have to start thinking about is immunization. And um, it's, it's a good platform for long-term planning and um, trying to figure out at what, at what point will we implement um, you know, the next public health procedure. Gotcha. Okay, Alex, you've got some questions. Yes, let's start, off with, let's start off with Rebecca Greenwell. She wants to ask about the long-term effects. We've talked about all the things we're learning that happens uh, to the body as a result of the disease. Rebecca, are you there? Yes, hi. Um, yeah, so I've just been reading some people say anecdotally that after they've recovered and even tested negative for the virus that months later their sense of smell and taste still haven't returned. Um, that they continue to experience um, what I've heard them describe as a kind of brain fog and that their resting heart rate is much higher than it was previously. Um, so is there any data that suggests that these anecdotes are real trends? Um, and just what does the research say about um, how the illness affects the body long term after people have recovered? Dr. Chen, that sounds like something you know about. Yeah, and I'm, I, I will have to admit, Rebecca, that I am not abreast of all of the literature because th there is so much coming out every day. But I think what you touched upon is true. Um, we know that um, there's this multi-system inflammatory condition or response that can happen in children. But recently, it's been also recognized for happening in young adults as well. Uh, it's an inflammatory response that uh, you know can be throughout the body. Uh, there are people who have um, kind of like a chronic fatigue syndrome, which is that brain fog uh, like condition that you described as well, where people really don't feel like they're 100 percent. They only feel like they're 70 percent or 50 percent for a prolonged period of time, many weeks, even after recovery. And, and the virus is gone, but the body still has not completely recovered. And we know that strokes um, and other things like heart attacks uh, have a higher risk. Of course, that's a long-term condition in which they have to, uh, again, uh, they're at a risk for, again, a repeat uh, a ro uh, stroke or, or heart attack uh, sometime in the future. So we don't know how long reaching some of these side effects can be. Um, a lot of them are being blamed on that inflammatory response that's gone awry. So again, we're, we're continuing to learn more and more about this, but it reaches all the organs of the body. Uh, could, could affect your kidney function, could affect uh, you know, your brain functioning uh, optimally, uh, and, and they do look like prolonged effects that could take weeks or even months. Are there other viruses that behave this way? Well, there, you know, I think that um, you know, we can say that uh, there are some chronic viruses that, that set up latency within the body, which means that you don't completely get over the infection. Uh, this is a virus that um, doesn't set up what's called latency. So that means that once you clear the virus, the virus is gone out of your body. It's not hiding out somewhere like HIV or hepatitis C. So this is uh, quite unique, but there are other um, uh, pathogens, um, say, for example, bacteria that can cause prolonged symptomatology. Um, and uh, again, uh, we're, we're learning so much, but uh, we're, we're not really sure. Like Lyme's disease, again, we think that you can clear it, but some people do have a, a chronic condition that can be a consequence of it uh, that we're trying to, again, understand. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Alex? All right. We have Maggie Smith, who's asking about testing and whether that's really an accurate way to figure out what's going on. Maggie, do you want to ask it your way? Sure. Hi. Thank you very much. This, these discussions throughout our uh, time home has been very valuable. Um, so the concern that I've been having is I, I keep hearing, and, and you re reiterated this again, that overall positive testing rate versus the um, total number of COVID tests uh, process is a good indicator of how we're doing. And the concern I have is I know 
numerous people that wind up getting tested regularly at either as a function of their job or for their kids to play sports, where they're getting COVID tests very regularly. And I worry that we are continually testing the same, or not all the time, but a lot of the same people over and over again. So how is it that the overall testing of total subjects versus total positive is is an indicator where it just seems like um, we could possibly be testing the same people over and over again, who uh, some who may have already um, had the virus and has cleared it, but need to continually to be tested just to go about their daily lives. Who wants to take that one on? Well, I can I can give one perspective, and then looks like Marianne may be chomping at the bit to also answer. So, uh, in general, when we test, there are two major purposes, and they may not always be uh, aligned with each other in terms of the overall goal. One is um, a test is is meant to be a tool to understand population wide burden of disease. The other one is an individual test where you're again just as an individual, you want to know whether or not you have the disease. And so um, when we do population-wide testing, we are um, oftentimes um, uh, satisfied with a test that may not have the best uh, test performance, may not have the highest sensitivity and specificity, but still gives us an idea of the burden of disease in a population. Individual testing, of course, uh, that requires that you have a highly sensitive and specific test um, because you really want to know the answer and you don't want to have a false positive or negative. Um, another way to answer your question is, yes, I think that percent um, test positive is, is one way to look at um, how disease is going in a population. I, I've had discussions very recently with the Maryland Department of Health in which we are actually looking to um, uh, change the way that we report, not change completely, but also report out the number of cases per 100,000 people in the population. That allows us to what we call normalize so that you can actually do comparisons for um, a rural population versus uh, an urban population where you can look at Maryland versus Virginia versus uh, California or countrywide. Um, so if everybody were to what we call normalize by doing cases per 100,000 people, it allows us to do much better comparisons because then you're not testing really you're not really trying to make comparisons, which could be apples to oranges, according to the number of tests that you're doing at, at any particular day or the types of tests. Um, so anyways, that's kind of a, a brief way of answering your question is that, yes, testing is actually a very robust discussion behind the scenes, and it continues to go on behind the scenes because now we're talking about antigen tests versus a point of care molecular diagnostic tests versus the PCR test that we use for the, the high sensitivity, high specificity testing that we're doing, say, at the IGS uh, on our campus. Dr. Clorin? Yeah, I was thinking that, that I think what you're pointing out is, is maybe the difference between the Maryland rate as, as shown by at the Hopkins site versus the Department of Health site. It's a different way of, of kind of counting. But um, as Dr. Chen pointed out, we may, it's a problem also to lump all different types of tests together. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a problem to have repeat tests in the same person. Um, if you look at the White House example, um, there were many people that were getting tested every, every, every day, right? And then all of a sudden, the positivity rate really went up. I mean, I think you could trust the, the, the positivity rate um, if it's going up in a population of people that have been, have had a low positivity rate. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say that it's not worthwhile because, because of that problem, but I think it is really important to be able to, and we can't yet with the way that we're collecting the results, but it's, it's important to be able to understand um, the types of tests and what they mean, and then also to somehow account for repeat measures, you know, in the same people. Right. Okay, Alex, got another one? Well, Shelly Tiemann has a two-part question about uh, immunocompromised patients. Shelly? Hi. Hi, Wilbur. Um, we have spoken Obviously, regarding um, my son, who is immunocompromised, a double liver transplant patient, and I was wondering what has been the increase in this in contracting this virus. What What are the? I I think I didn't hear the complete question. Could you ask it again? 
has there been a large increase in immunocompromised patients contracting COVID? Yeah, well, I guess the good answer is that no, we haven't seen a huge amount of immunocompromised. And I think that that's because the immunocompromised recognize that they're at high risk and therefore they're probably taking extra precautions to make sure that they don't get infections. So, um, you know, probably your son as well is trying to stay as home home as much as possible and really making sure that they minimize the number of contacts with the outside world. Absolutely. I think that that's what's happening. Yeah, yep. yeah, we kept him home inside of a bubble almost um, as if we did when he first came home from transplant. Yeah, and, and it's like uh, being in a bubble, which is too, too bad under these conditions, you know, having to be physically and socially isolated in many different ways. But I think that that's probably the best scenario. Uh, there are other people who are immune compromised but don't have the luxury and either have to, you know, again, maintain their employment and don't have other family structures to fall back on. So, Shelly, I think that, again, you've, you've provided um, an excellent example of how we can protect loved ones uh, from this virus. Okay, and that gives me, brings me to my second part of my question. Um, will employees with immunocompromised children receive special consideration um, in the option to continue teleworking once UMB reopens? Yeah, I, I can't answer that specifically except to say we already have an HR process I know that's looking at special circumstances like that. And from a physician point of view, I would certainly want to be highly sensitive to that kind of issue. Uh, I wish I could make a commitment to you over this webinar, but I'll make sure uh, that, that we are addressing that through our HR process. Okay, Alex. All right, we have uh, Monica Martinez. Monica, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. So I think the other, the one, the first question I had was already answered by Dr. Chan, and that's, that's sort of long-term effects of the COVID-19. Because um, I think as people look at this and like I may not be high risk, like I might get it and be asymptomatic, but I guess the concern would be that even if I got it, that I may have, have other effects not related or related, but that may, you know, compromise my system in some other way. And the other, um, but I think he addressed that already. Um, the other question I had was about reinfection. And I recently heard something about um, mutation of the virus, and how does that affect, I guess, the whole vaccine process? Yeah, thankfully, so far, the mutation of the virus has been relatively small, meaning that even the vaccines that are being developed right now should continue to uh, develop protection. But I think what you raised is that um, there is always the possibility that um, as this continues to go along, uh, just like influenza viruses, can, can mutate uh, over time such that cumulatively it's uh, what we call drifted. And so you might have to update the virus you know, from year to year. That's what we do with influenza. So, um, so again, there's that theoretical possibility that that could happen here. Hopefully we'll have the COVID vaccines and we'll achieve what we call population-wide immunity so that we can stop this pandemic. And then it'll become, in that setting, we think that it'll just be among one of those common cold viruses, respiratory viruses that we see every year, but it will not be as lethal as we're seeing right now. Okay. Alex? All right, Lee Sun is with us, and uh, she has a question about also about children and going back to work. Lee, are you there? Lee, are you there? All right, well, I'm going to have to ask it for her. She says, I have uh, two school-aged kids. Will their school reopening affect any of UMB's reopening decisions? Or ultimately, are people like me uh, returning to campus, uh, will that, you know, what will the impact be on me? Yeah, and, and I think this is kind of like the prior question, and that is that we're paying a lot of attention to this. We just sent out a letter today saying that telework is going to be 
the continued practice for at least the next four or five months. Uh, and so, uh, I, I, again, I want to reemphasize we want to be very sensitive to these issues. Uh, and I have firsthand experience because I have a first grader here at home with me. Yes, it's a grandson, uh, but it's an ordeal. Uh, and it takes a lot of time and attention, and there aren't many options. So I, I want to assure people that we're paying attention to this. We don't have answers yet because we don't know when telework is going to change. Uh, but but uh, this is very important to me to make sure that we do deal with individual needs of, of people. Sorry, that's not a definitive answer quite yet. All right. Here's someone you know pretty well, I think, Leilani Uttenreiter. Leilani, are you there? Hi, Leilani. Oh. Leilani, are you there? Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Gerald, Dr. Chan, every, and uh, uh, Dr. Corin, and Steve. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Um, I have a question about the vaccine rollout. Is there a plan to prioritize certain individuals that are that suffer from the side effects of coronavirus more than others in terms of rolling out a vaccine when a safe vaccine is available? Thank you. I guess I'll, I'll answer that one. So, you know, uh, the, the answer is yes. I think a lot of groups have been working on this question of allocation of a of a limited resource vaccine, which is what we expect initially. And eventually there will be uh, large amounts of vaccine, but initially in the first few months, uh, it, it will be limited. And so that means we have to use those doses uh, as judiciously as possible in an ethical manner. And in a way, again, that um, derives the maximum benefit. And so again, I think your thinking is correct. There's the National Academies that have been actually meeting on this in the US. The, uh, the WHO has also been deliberating about this on the kind of global level. And uh, within the US, the CDC has the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices that's also kind of trying to develop policy um, so that when vaccines do become available, and there may be multiple vaccines simultaneously, uh, that we'll be able to work it out. I'll just remind you, some of the vaccines are live vaccines and live vaccines traditionally cannot be used for the immunocompromised. And we uh, have a precaution usually for using them in older adults, uh, which is usually defined as 65 and over. So again, a large part of our population may not be able to receive um, some of these vaccines. And so uh, we'll have to uh, think of ways where we're uh, using the existing vaccines in a way that makes sense um, is is ethical, uh, but also judicious as well. Dr. Uh, Corin? Yes, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to add that, that we are working within the system to start early planning and thinking about how how to prioritize, you know, based on um, the type of work and type of risk, you know, um, all the different populations here. Right, which reminds me, you're hearing a lot of activity about prioritization of COVID vaccine. Uh, I want to remind you all that getting an, a flu vaccine is a very important thing to do. Uh, and I, I know we're all sort of laughing about that, but that's really important. Um, now I will tell you, I haven't gotten my flu vaccine yet, but the reason I haven't gotten it is because this morning, uh, Dr. Chen, I got my booster shot from the Moderna trial. So I'm not allowed to get the vaccine for influenza quite yet. But the, the thing I would wanna make to the audience is to say, look, these clinical trials are here. I would urge you all to participate in them. It's an individual decision for each of you. For me, it's, it's a no brainer. I wanna be part of these trials. It's important to be part of these trials. Uh, and here I am sitting here. I think this is my fifth vaccine trial, Wilbur. Okay, and uh, my hair didn't grow back, but but I'm still here and strong. <laughs> so uh, uh, I would simply urge everybody to know that you do have a Novavax trial starting pretty soon. Uh, hopefully in the next coming month. So it, it, end of October, beginning of November, continue to listen out for it. We, we thought that it was going to be in October, but now we're in October. So I think what we've heard now is November. 
But to emphasize one other thing, they, as someone said, younger adults, they're looking for younger adults over 65. For any of you who fall into that category, they're looking for underrepresented minorities, uh, et cetera. So uh, are there any other special categories there, Wilbur? In, in the Novavax trial, we continue to look for older adults as well. That, that's a very important segment of the population that we need to protect. And that's what we're going to continue to study as well. Thank you. Okay, Alex. I'm just glad to hear that uh, being under 65 makes you a younger adult. That is you've made my day, Dr. Chair. Uh, but speaking of vaccine tri trials, Jane Algair is uh, with us. She has a two-part question, and one of them is about just that. Jane, are you there? Oh. Yes? Go ahead. You can speak up. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, um, well, one of them is, what do you recommend for your immune system, any type of supplements? And the second thing is, you know, how, obviously, you just answered this one is how you sign up for the vaccine trial. I guess I will look out on the ELM and other sources on that we've been receiving. Thank you. So nutritional supplements, I don't think that I endorse anyone in particular, other than saying that uh, maintain a healthy diet lots of fruits and vegetables, um, and uh, again, exercise as well goes a, a large part of contributing to a healthy immune response. Um, getting your flu vaccine, of course, uh, President Gerald already mentioned, but those are all the elements that we have in our control uh, to help us uh, to minimize the impacts of COVID. And, and it's uh, on the CVD website, I believe, uh, That's right. For, yeah, for enrollment. I think it's cvdclinicaltrials.org is the specific website if you wanted to uh, enter your information and then you'll get a call back. Right. I think the most common reason for not being included is you just got your flu vaccine. I think a lot of people are getting their flu vaccines and, and that's why right. we have to wait then uh, a whole month after their flu vaccine, a, a whole two weeks. Uh, after their flu vaccine. Yeah. All right, Alex. Well, uh, Terry Sharp has a question that's uh, I think aimed at the recovery task force. So uh, for Steve and, and Marianne, and that is, uh, do we anticipate requiring UMB employees being vaccinated? Is that part of the discussion of the recovery task force? Steve? Yeah, it's, it's certainly on our radar. We haven't gotten to the point where we've uh, you know, we we talked about the flu vaccine about whether to make it mandatory or not, and we we shied away from that. But we we haven't right now formally, you know, made any proposals to leadership on the COVID vaccine. I think it's a little early to do that. Um, on a side note, I actually I also did the the Pfizer study over in the biopark, and it was a rather rewarding experience doing that that uh, COVID vaccine trial. So it's definitely on our radar. So thanks. What what, what was rewarding about it? I oh, just, I, I, oh, it just yeah, I like to know what how things are working as a lay person, just you know, see what's going on and that. Oh, you do get a little money, so there was a, re a financial <laughs> reward. So, but that's not why I did it. I just, I just felt you know an obligation to do it. Dr. Clark. Well, I think that one of the considerations for making anything mandatory would uh, be whether or not the government um, has made a recommendation for that. Yeah. And, and I think we're still in a public health emergency, technically. Is that not correct? And, and so the rules are different in those kind of situations and in ordinary life. Uh, and of course, if you're a healthcare provider, many of the facilities will require that you have vaccinations of a certain sort, not just uh, flu, uh, but, but others as well. So it depends upon what your role at UMB is as well. Yeah, that's a good point, President Gerald. You know, um, we're still in a pandemic right now, which means that all of these drugs that are under emergency use authorization are uh, active. But once the pandemic is over and that uh, declaration is declared over, then those go away. Um, so that's a, a legal implication of that. I think that affects some of our testing as well, doesn't it? I think so. A lot of the testing is emergency use also authorization. Uh, so uh, I guess we're going to have to wait and see there. Mm -hmm. OK, Alex. Terry, Terry, by the way, also asked uh, Dr. Gerald how you feel after your your trials. When you get that shot, what kind of reaction do you get? 
I understand that everyone's different. Everyone reacts differently. But but what's your situation? Well, I'll, I'll, let me answer it in two ways. Uh, and, and Dr. Chen can add to this. My, my impression of speaking with the staff at CVD is that there's a few local reactions. Uh, they've all been manageable. Uh, my own reaction was minimal. I had a sore arm for a couple of days and a, a little bit of a of a fullness there. My daughter, who was a healthcare provider, was in the trial. She had a red spot for a while. But in general, the uh, the adverse reactions that I've seen personally have been quite limited. Uh, when you ask, how did you feel? I, I was hoping Dr. Deck was going to say, well, you feel good because you hope that you're furthering uh, the idea of our mission, which is to improve the human condition. Uh, and this is a great example. A vaccine is a great example of improving the human condition. Uh, look at smallpox or look at polio. Uh, smallpox is eradicated. I think we're still saying that, aren't we, Wilbur and Marianne? Okay, polio isn't, isn't eradicated, uh, but it's certainly a very controllable disease. Uh, and so that, that's, that's our mission right there. So anything to add on that? No? I wonder, Wilbur, maybe you can answer this. How many of our senior leaders uh, participate in, in clinical trials? I don't want to intimidate here. Uh, on the well, other hand, it's an important message. Yeah, I, I think it is a very important and powerful message. Um, some of our clinical studies, the, the protocol will specifically state that if you're part of the study team, that you cannot participate. And the worry yes. is is you could be biased in the way that you report and you could affect the, why, the, the way that the trial results come out. Uh, in the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, uh, the protocol did not state that. And so I was the first one to volunteer. And that was because at that time there was a lot of media, just as there is now, maybe less than now, but um, there was a lot of media at the time and people had concerns about that first vaccine being launched and being tested. Uh, and, and so I went ahead and, and said, I'll be the first one and you can take pictures of me and you can interview me. And so we did have a, a number. Uh, and, and again, that quelled uh, questions to a certain extent within the community and the population uh, because they saw that, um, you know, the people who were leading the trials were also the ones that were standing up and taking the vaccine first. Yeah. Okay. Alex? All right. I had told Bridget Bard we would come to her next. So, Bridget, I'm sorry. Hold on just a moment because this uh, question from Facebook, one of our Facebook viewers, uh, Tony Pollan, speaks the way you're just talking about. She wrote, I've tried several times to sign up for a trial and heard nothing, twice through Maryland and the National Registry. What am I doing wrong? There's a lot of people interested in taking part, but it seems difficult for some people to, to get in into the trial. So I, I, maybe I can answer that. Tony, I, I do know who you are. So I think you're not of the, the, of the older age group, so you don't fit up to that high risk category. Um, I, I think that you probably don't have some of the underlying medical conditions that also put you at high risk. And a lot of these studies, um, they quickly enrolled into the low risk groups, which is the lower, you know, the younger adults, the ones without medical conditions, the ones that did not have an occupational risk, which meant that they had an occupation that, that they could not uh, stay in telework. They had to actually you know, be a first responder or, or uh, as a physician, see face-to-face -face with patients that had COVID, those sorts of things. So that quickly enrolled, and that probably is why when you fill out the information on the website, you fill out information that is limited demographics, but also your risk factors uh, for either having severe disease, which is an underlying condition or your age, or a condition where you might have a high risk for getting the infection, which is uh, certain zip codes of our community that have high risk. Uh, if you live in a uh, congregate housing, if you, um, are in a multi-generational home, you know, 10 people or more where you have three generations, grandpa, uh, parents, and, and kids. Uh, so those would be some of the factors um, in general for uh, an explanation to why a person might not get a call back immediately. But I bet you got your point across, Tony. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alex? 
All right, Bridget, you've been very patient. Bridget Bard, what's your question? Hi, so much, and thank you for this informative session. I really appreciate it. Um, mine is just a basic question about this anticipated spike that we're talking about. Um, is it logical to think that since we are wearing masks, not everyone, but people are wearing masks and we are social distancing, that possibly the spike would not be as bad as what they're predicting. Dr. Clorin, Dr. Chan. Uh, you want me to go for it first? Okay. <laughs> so um, the, the spike, I think uh, the answer is uh, it's possible. And so I'll, I'll point to one piece of evidence the Southern Hemisphere just went through their winter. Yes. And we just saw the mildest influenza season for the Southern Hemisphere that's been documented for many, many, many years. Uh, it was, it was um, very few cases of influenza. And that was probably because they had universal masking. They were doing the telework and physical distancing, just as we are here in the U.S. So that went a long way to preventing influenza. Now, they still had COVID cases. So I think that, yes, it probably will go a long way if we continue as a population to maintain physical distancing, uh, universal masking, those sorts of things. That will definitely be a helpful public health tool to minimize uh, the effects of COVID. But with the colder weather, um, we still expect that respiratory viruses in general, that's when they come up every winter. Um, you know, I have uh, hospital-based data where our microbiology lab looks at all the different respiratory viruses, adenovirus, RSV, human metanumovirus, uh, human parainfluenza viruses, uh, all these other viruses that uh, um, some of them call as common colds, but some of them do hospitalized kids. And again, they all come up during the winter and then go away during the summer. So there's something about the seasonality. It's the temperature, the humidity, the, the fact that we congregate indoors during the cold weather, all of that, comes together to help us to predict that, yes, COVID-19 will probably get worse this winter. If we maintain that physical distancing, though, we can continue to minimize those effects. Dr. Clorin? Yeah, here's what I worry about. Um, it's the reopening and uh, letting restaurants go to 75% and you know bars going to 75% as the weather gets colder and people are not gonna be sitting outside anymore. And we, I, so I, so my, what I anticipate is we're gonna do fine on campus, I think, with not spreading it to each other through the mechanisms that we have in place and people really paying attention to it. But I think we're going to see more people getting it in the community with the relaxing of the precautions at the same time as things are getting colder. So I think that's my concern. Okay. Alex? All right, Tamika Super writes, if a person can be exposed and infected with COVID-19 more than once and have antibodies from both, is the vaccine really beneficial, like for previously infected people? So the infection, um, we know that not everybody gets antibodies after an infection, especially if it's a mild infection. Um, with mild infection, uh, a lot of people fail to have an antibody response, which is part of predicting a protective response. Now, if you're hospitalized, if you have really severe COVID, uh, you have a much higher chance. In fact, it's about 90% of people who are hospitalized will have antibody responses. So again, uh, going back to the question, you know, people may get sequential infections where, again, those antibody responses might be limited. They might only last for a couple of weeks or months uh, and then go away. But, and then by that time, you're susceptible again. Uh, these vaccines that we're developing are designed to give us, you, you know, closer to the 100% response and also to give longer lasting responses. And that's why we're measuring out to two years in a lot of these individuals to hopefully be able to document and show that these vaccines protect, give those antibody responses for a long period of time. Alex, we still got time for one or two more. Uh, we do. Frank Lancaster is here. Frank, are you uh, are you with us? Frank, go ahead. Well, he may be having trouble. He he writes uh, based on what I've 
Red and Herda generally felt that the probability of transmission of COVID outdoors was negligible. But with the recent possible transmissions at the outdoor Rose Garden event at the White House, I'm not sure what to think anymore. It's obvious being outdoors is better than being indoors, but should we be much more wary of being outdoors or is the White House event just an extreme event? Well, I, I think the White House is, is emblematic of, um, of what can happen. I, I think Marianne talked about exhaled breath, you know, and, uh, you know, so that's exactly it. Indoors is worse than outdoors because, of course, um, you know, you're in a confined space, and so that air will recirculate. When we're outdoors, of course, we have the UV light and everything else that helps out. But we've still seen, and the CDC did come out with a publication, I think it's about two weeks old now, where they showed that um, people who dined at restaurants, and that was outdoors and patio restaurants uh, dining as well, there was a twofold increase in your risk of getting a COVID infection. So being outdoors still is a risk. That's why it's really essential for us to try to maintain that physical distancing and still uh, when we're out and about to mask. So again, when we're eating, we can't mask. Um, we're not masked, you know, and, and again, that exhaled breath is going to be so essential for you to kind of visualize in your mind. Um, outdoors is better than indoors, but that doesn't mean no risk. Dr. Lauren, anything to add on that? What he said. No. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> okay, Alex? Well, there, there are two questions. I'm going to try to try to see if there's a way to combine them. I know they're very different, but they, they, along the same vein, uh, two, two people who want to remain anonymous are asking about other procedures or other conditions. So the, the one person writes, uh, what do panelists recommend for elective but important procedures like mammograms? Should we wait to schedule them? And the other questioner is writing about the, the people who need long-term care for things like respiratory uh, conditions and heart failure. Um, what should they be doing during this? Yeah. So I think the good news is that for a lot of the uh, elective procedures, um, uh, most places, and, and this is virtually all of our, uh, you know, physicians, clinics, urgent care centers, have now devised uh, systems in place to be able to protect their patients. So I would not delay um, your routine care, your screening mammogram, your screening colonoscopy, uh, arthroscopy that you need for a knee, uh, a hip replacement, those sorts of things. Again, when you schedule, hopefully on the other end, again, most places are doing this, and of course, uh, anyone within the University of Maryland Medical Systems is doing this, so you can feel confident of that, is that they are looking very carefully at, at trying to minimize the traffic in the waiting room, uh, trying to have in place proper PPE so that when you come in, that you don't get an inadvertent infection. So that's kind of one thing that people can trust these days is that people have that in place. The other part of the question was, uh, you know, people who are concerned because they have an Im immunocompromised, their other high risk condition. And again, I think that uh, for those people to try as possible to maintain um, a healthy lifestyle, but also to continue to observe that physical distance as much as possible and minimizing contacts with people um, that, again, they are not familiar with, that they don't know. Again, that means uh, keeping grocery trips to very short um, as possible, um, you know, and not going uh, dining at restaurants. I think it's better to get the DoorDash or whatever it is you want, but to have it delivered or to pick it up really quick and have it put in your trunk and then to drive it home. Uh, to still enjoy, because I, I think it's still important for us to recognize local businesses are hurting these days, and I'm a patron of, of my local restaurants and want to keep those businesses thriving as best as possible under these conditions. So again, I, I don't want to dissuade people from from supporting the local businesses, but we have to do it in a responsible way. Dr. Clark, Dr. Deck, anything to add to that? No. Thank you. Nope. I just, have, I just have one quick clarification. I, apparently, I got that question a little bit wrong. So, so, and, and even though I know we're up against time, uh, the question, the second question, I wanted to know about the long-term effects and what about long-term care for people who develop heart conditions or respiratory illnesses because of COVID. What do you, what, what do you know wow, about? That's a that's the, a hard one. I don't know yeah, what insurance yeah. will cover. Um, we don't know how long-lasting these effects are, but I think again. 
that is part of what we are concerned about is that this would be an ongoing burden even if a person you know overcomes the initial infection and goes home for care if they require those additional resources like supplemental oxygen for many months or even years with uh, occupational physical therapy or some other things, that's a, a resource that's limited, uh, again, right now, because we're using so much of it. But if it continues on, it could be an economic burden, again, to that person, especially if they don't have insurance that will pay for it. So I'm worried about the general population. I think for those of us in, at UMB, we're employees uh, or staff, we have uh, pretty good you know, benefits as part of our health benefits. Uh, but I'm talking more broadly about uh, the general population. Yeah, one thing I would add to the earlier question, uh, Dr. Jim Campbell, who some of you know, wrote an, an op-ed, I think in the Sun paper, uh, deploring the idea that children were not getting their vaccinations or routine vaccinations, uh, as well as I'm sure the flu vaccine. And, and you certainly don't want to fall into that trap. You want to make sure that they get their vaccinations. The other one comment about the safety of the workplace uh, at the hospital, and Wilbur may know the exact numbers, but in, in uh, surveillance serology, in other words, who's been exposed, uh, the, the uh, uh, positive serology, meaning they've been infected uh, in the hospital workforce, and this was over 4,000 people, uh, had a very, very low conversion rate. So it would appear to me that, that it's a very safe environment. You're not likely to get COVID in that environment. Wilbur, would you echo that or add to that? Yeah, I think so. I think the hospital has done a remarkable job in trying to create the conditions so that we can continue to take care of patients, uh, you know, in a safe manner. So we are out of time. I first of all want to thank all three of the panelists for a very engaging uh, discussion. Uh, it's an important topic. We aren't done yet. Uh, there's going to be more of these topics. Uh, and I want to thank the participants for one participating. And for those who had questions, thank you for asking them. With that, I think we'll uh, end this session. Uh, Alex, again, thank you for a great show. So see you all later. Thank you. Thank you.